Hey, thrilling suspense fanatics. Sometimes a story comes along that's so weird, so bizarre and outré and, and sinister that it has to be explored more fully. So in order to understand what it is that we're about to listen to, which is the third part of Vathek, a posthumous collaboration between Clark Ashton Smith and William Beckford, I wanted to first establish who William Beckford is and why he is important to Clark Ashton Smith. So William Beckford is the son of the the wealthiest British commoner, I guess, uh, to that point in British history. His father was mayor of London, and William Beckford inherited 3,000 slaves across numerous plantations in Jamaica, which is a monstrous monstrous thing to contemplate in addition to the sort of a horror that's attendant to um owning 3000 people and and all of the depredation which that entails he was personally a bizarre person uh as well like his his individual life choices were very very strange so starting with the most kind of uh obvious of these things he, you know his dad is this this big money getter you know owning all these plantations bringing in all this income william beckford squanders this money he engaged in you know ill-advised and and megalomi megalomaniacal megalomaniacal building projects uh, including the construction of an abbey at font hill to house a large art and and book collection with a huge tower that collapsed shortly after it was built. Um, he had a, a monthly income of a hundred thousand pounds, a hundred thousand pounds that he managed to spend extremely extravagantly. He was tutored in music by Mozart, like the Mozart. Um, and he uh, was was bisexual, which is not in itself, um, you know, outre or bizarre. But when he was uh, 18, he met a 10 year old fella who he is uh, thought to have been carrying on a relationship with for some time. And that's that's certainly outre and bizarre. That's not cool. He also was sleeping with his cousin's wife so very little was out of bounds for mr william beckford he lived a life that is very much like a character that clark ashton smith would write and it's therefore fitting that clark ashton smith was fascinated by his literary style by his his decadence and finished off the third part of Vathek, which is the most important bit of fiction that William Beckford wrote. So with some background on these uh, bizarre characters, I think it's now appropriate to actually begin our story. The third episode of Vathek, the story of the Princess Zulkaius and the Prince Kalila. My father, Lord, can scarcely be unknown to you, inasmuch as the Caliph Motasem had entrusted to his care the fertile province of Masra. Nor would he have been unworthy of his exalted position if, in view of man's ignorance and weakness, an inordinate desire to control the future were not to be accounted an unpardonable error. The Emir Abu Taher Ahmed, however, for such was my father's name, was very far from recognizing this truth. Only too often did he seek to forestall providence and to direct the course of events in spite the decrees of heaven. Ah, terrible indeed are those decrees. Sooner or later their accomplishment is sure. Vainly do we seek to oppose them. During a long course of years, everything that flourished under my father's rule and among the emirs who have successfully administered that beautiful province, Abu Taher Ahmed, will not be forgotten. Following his speculative bent, he enlisted the service of certain experienced Nubians born near the sources of the Nile, who had studied the stream throughout its course and knew all its characteristics and the properties of its waters. 
and, with their aid, he carried out his impious design of regulating the overflow of the river. Thus, he covered the country with a too luxuriant vegetation, which left it afterwards exhausted. The people, always slaves to outward appearances, applauded his enterprises, worked indefatigably at the unnumbered canals with which he intersected the land, and, blinded by his successes, passed lightly over any unfortunate circumstances accompanying them. If, out of every ten ships that he sent forth to traffic, According to his fancy, a single ship came back richly freighted after a successful voyage. The wreck of the other nine was counted for nothing. Moreover, as, owing to his care and vigilance, commerce prospered under his rule, he was himself deceived as to his losses, and took to himself all the glory of his gains. Soon Abu Taher Ahmed came to be convinced that if he could recover the arts and sciences of the ancient Egyptians, his power would be unbounded. He believed that, in the remote ages of antiquity, men had appropriated to their own use some rays of divine wisdom, and thus had been enabled to work marvels, and he did not despair of bringing back once again that glorious time— for this purpose, he caused search to be made among the ruins abounding in the country for the mysterious tablets which, according to the report of the sages who swarmed in his court, would show how the arts and sciences in question were to be acquired, and also indicate the means of discovering hidden treasures, and subduing the intelligences by which those treasures are guarded. Never before his time had any Mussulman puzzled his brains over hieroglyphics, now, however, search was made on his behalf for hieroglyphics of every kind, in all quarters, in the remotest provinces, the strange symbols being faithfully copied on linen cloths. I have seen these cloths a thousand times, stretched out on the roofs of our palace, nor could bees be made more busy and assiduous about a bed of flowers than were the sages about these painted sheets, but— as each sage entertained a different opinion as to the meaning of what was there depicted, arguments were frequent, and quarrels ensued. Not only did the sages spend hours of daylight in prosecuting their researches, but the moon often shed its beams upon them while so occupied. They did not dare to light torches upon the terraced roofs, for fear of alarming the faithful Mussulmans, who were beginning to blame my father's veneration for an idolatrous antiquity, and regarded all these painted symbols, these figures, with a pious horror. Meanwhile, the emir, who would never have thought of neglecting any real matter of business, however unimportant, for the pursuit of his strange studies, was by no means so particular with regard to his religious observances, and often forgot to perform the ablutions ordained by the law. The women of his harem did not fail to perceive this, but were afraid to speak, as, for one reason and another, their influence had considerably waned. But on a certain day, Shaban, the chief of the eunuchs, who was very old and very pious, presented himself before his master, holding a ewer and golden basin, and said, The waters of the Nile have been given for the cleansing of all our impurities. Their source is in the clouds of heaven, not in the temples of idols. Take and use those waters, for you stand in need of them. The emir, duly impressed by the action and speech of Shaban, yielded to his remonstrances, and, instead of unpacking a large bale of painted cloths which had just arrived from a far distance, ordered the eunuch to serve the day's collation in the hall of the golden trellises, and to assemble there all his slaves and all his birds, of which he kept a large number in the aviaries of sandalwood. Immediately the place rang to the sound of instruments of music, and groups of slaves appeared, all dressed in their most attractive garments, and each leading in leash a peacock whiter than snow. One only of these slaves, whose slender and graceful form was a delight to the eye, had no bird in leash and kept her veil down. "'Why this eclipse?' said the emir to Shaban. 
Lord, he answered with joyful mien, I am better than all your astrologers, for it is I who have discovered this lovely star, but do not imagine that she is yet within your reach. Her father, the holy and venerable Iman Abzenderud, will never consent to make you happy in the possession of her charms unless you perform your ablutions with greater regularity and give the go-by to the sages and their hieroglyphics. My father, without replying to Shaban, ran to snatch away the veil that hid the countenance of Gulendi Begum, for such was the name of Abzenderud's daughter, and he did so with such violence that he nearly crushed two peacocks and overturned several baskets of flowers. To this sudden heat succeeded a kind of ecstatic super. At last he cried, How beautiful she is! How divine! Go fetch at once the Iman of Sosuf. Let the nuptial chamber be got ready, and all necessary preparations for our marriage be complete within one hour. But, Lord, said Shaban in consternation, you forget that Gulendi Begum cannot marry you without the consent of her father, who makes it a condition that you should abandon— What nonsense are you talking? interrupted the emir do you think i am fool enough not to prefer this young virgin fresh as the dew of the morning to cartloads of hieroglyphics mouldy and the colour of dead ashes as to Abzenderud, go and fetch him if you like but quickly for i shall certainly not wait a moment longer than i please hasten shaban said gulendi begum modestly Hasten, you see that I am not here in case to make any very effectual resistance. It's my fault, mumbled the eunuch as he departed, but I shall do what I can to rectify my error. Accordingly, he flew to find Abzenderud, but that faithful servant of Allah had gone from home very early in the morning and sought the open fields in order to pursue his pious investigations into the growth of plants and the life of insects. A death-like pallor overspread his countenance when he saw Shaban swooping down upon him like a raven of ill omen, and heard him tell in broken accents how the emir had promised nothing, and how he himself might well arrive too late to exact the pious conditions he had so deeply pondered. Nevertheless, the iman did not lose courage, and reached my father's palace in a very few moments, but unfortunately he was by this time so out of breath that he sank down on a sofa and remained for over an hour panting and breathless. While all the eunuchs were doing their best to revive the holy man, Shaban had quickly gone up to the apartment assigned to Abu Taher Ahmed's pleasures. But his zeal offered some diminution when he saw the door guarded by two black eunuchs, who, brandishing their sabers, informed him that if he ventured to take one more step forward, his head would roll at his own feet. Therefore, he had nothing better to do than to return to Abzenderud, whose gaspings he regarded with wild and troubled eyes, lamenting the while over his own imprudence in bringing Gulendi Begum within the emir's power. Notwithstanding the care my father was taking for the entertainment of the new sultana, he had heard something of the dispute between the black eunuchs and Shaban, and had a fair notion of what was going on. As soon, therefore, as he judged it convenient, he came to find Abzenderud in the hall of the golden trellises, and presenting Gulendi Begum to the holy man, assured him that, awaiting his arrival, he, the emir, had made her his wife. At these words, the iman uttered a lamentable and piercing cry, which relieved the pressure on his chest, and, rolling his eyes in a fearful manner, he said to the new sultana, Wretched woman, dost thou not know that rash and ill-considered acts lead ever to a miserable end? Thy father would have made thy lot secure, but thou hast not awaited the result of his efforts, or rather, it is heaven itself that mocks all human provisions. I ask nothing more of the emir. Let him deal with thee, as with his hieroglyphics, as he deems best. I foresee untold evils in the future, but I shall not be there to witness them. Rejoice for a while, intoxicated with thy pleasures." As for me, I call to my aid the angel of death, and hope within three days to rest in the bosom of our great prophet. 
After saying these words, he rose to his feet, tottering. His daughter strove in vain to hold him back. He tore his robe from her trembling hands. She fell fainting to the ground, and while the distracted emir was striving to bring her back to her senses, the obstinate Abzendarud went muttering from the room. At first it was the thought that the holy man would not keep his vow quite literally, and would suffer himself to be comforted, but such was not the case. On reaching his own house he began by stopping his ears by cotton wool, so as not to hear the clamor and adjuration of his friends. And then, having seated himself on mats in his cell, with his legs crossed and his head in his hands, he remained in that posture speechless, and taking no food, and finally, at the end of three days, expired, according to his prayer. He was buried magnificently, and during the obsequies, Shaban did not fail to manifest his grief by slashing his flesh without mercy, and soaking the earth with little rivulets of his blood, after which, having caused balm to be applied to his wounds, he returned to the duties of his office. Meanwhile, the emir had no small difficulty in assuaging the despair of Gulendi Begum, and often cursed the hieroglyphics, which had been its first efficient cause. At last his attentions touched the heart of the sultana. She regained her ordinary equability of spirits and became pregnant, and everything returned to its accustomed order. The emir, his mind always dwelling on the magnificence of the ancient pharaohs, built after their manner, a palace with twelve pavilions, proposing, at an early date, to install in each pavilion a son. Unfortunately, his wives brought forth nothing but daughters. At each new birth he grumbled, gnashed his teeth, accused Mahomet of being the cause of his mishaps, and would have been altogether unbearable if Gulendi Begum had not found means to moderate his evil temper she induced him to come every night into her apartment, where, by a thousand ingenious devices, she succeeded in introducing fresh air, while, in other parts of the palace, the atmosphere was stifling. During her pregnancy, my father never left the dais on which she reclined. This dais was set on a large and long gallery overlooking the Nile, and so disposed as to seem about on a level with the stream, so close, too, that any one reclining upon it could throw into the water the seeds of any pomegranate he might be eating. The best dancers, the most excellent magicians, were always about the palace. Every night, pantomimes were performed to the light of a thousand golden lamps, lamps placed on the floor so as to bring out the fineness and grace of the performer's feet. The dancers themselves cost my father immense sums in golden fringed slippers and sandals a glitter with jewelry, and indeed, when they were all in motion together the effect was dazzling. But notwithstanding this accumulation of splendors, the Sultana passed very unhappy days on her dais, with the same indifference that a poor wretch tormented by sleeplessness watches the scintillations of the stars, so did she see pass before her eyes all this whirl of performers in their brilliancy and charm. Anon, she would think of the wrath that seemed almost prophetic of her venerable father, anon she would deplore his strange and untimely end. A thousand times she would interrupt the choir of singers, crying, Fate has decreed my ruin, heaven will not vouchsafe me a son, and my husband will banish me from his sight. The torment of her mind intensified the pain and discomfort attendant on her condition. My father, thereupon, was so greatly perturbed that, for the first time in his life, he made appeal to heaven, and ordered prayers be offered up in every mosque. Nor did he omit the giving of alms, for he caused it to be publicly announced that all beggars were to assemble in the largest court of the palace, and would there be served with rice, each according to his individual appetite. There followed such a crush every morning at the palace gates that the incomers were nearly suffocated. Mendicants swarmed in from all parts by land and by river. Whole villages would come down the stream on rafts, and the appetites of all were enormous, for the buildings which my father had erected, his costly pursuit of hieroglyphics, and his maintenance of the sages had caused some scarcity throughout the land. 
Among those who came from a very far distance was a man of an extreme age and great singularity by name Abdul Gabdol Guheman, the hermit of the great sandy desert. He was eight feet high, so ill-proportioned, and of a leanness so extreme that he looked like a skeleton and was hideous to behold. Nevertheless, this lugubrious and forbidden piece of human mechanism enshrined the most benevolent and religious spirit in the universe. With a voice of thunder, he proclaimed the will of the prophet and said openly it was a pity that a prince who distributed rice to the poor and in such great profusion should be a lover of hieroglyphics. People crowded around him. The imams, the mullahs, the muezzins did nothing but sing his praises. His feet, though ingrained with the sand of his native desert, were freely kissed. Nay, the very grains of the sand from his feet were gathered up and treasured in caskets of amber. One day he proclaimed the truth and the horror of the sciences of evil, in a voice so loud and resonant that the great standard set before the palace trembled. The terrible sound penetrated into the interior of the harem. The women and the eunuchs fainted away in the hall of the golden trellises. The dancers stood with one foot arrested in the air. The mummers had not the courage to pursue their antics. The musicians suffered their instruments to fall to the ground, and Gulendi Begum thought to die of fright as she lay on her dais. Abu Taher Ahmed stood astounded. His conscience smote him for his idolatrous proclivities, and during a few remorseful moments he thought that the avenging angel had come to turn him into stone, and not himself only, but the people committed to his charge. After standing for some time, upright with arms uplifted in the gallery of the daises, he called Shaban to him and said, The sun has not lost its brightness, the Nile flows peacefully in its bed. What means, then, that this supernatural cry has just resounded through my palace? Lord, answered the pious eunuch, this is the voice of truth and is spoken to you through the mouth of the venerable Abu Gabdoel Gueman, the hermit of the sandy desert, the most faithful, the most zealous of the servants of the prophet, who has in nine days journeyed three hundred leagues to make proof of your hospitality and to impart to you the knowledge with which he is inspired. Do not neglect the teachings of a man who, in wisdom, in piety, and in stature, surpasses the most enlightened, the most devout, and the most gigantic of the inhabitants of the earth. All your people are in ecstasy. Trade is at a standstill. The inhabitants of the city hasten to hear him, neglecting their wanted assemblies in the public gardens. The storytellers are without hearers at the margins of the public fountains. Jusuf himself was not wiser than he, and had no greater knowledge of the future. At these last words, the emir was suddenly smitten with the desire of consulting Abu Gabdol with regard to his family affairs, and particularly with regard to the great projects he entertained for the future advantage of his sons, who were not yet born. He deemed himself happy in being thus able to consult a living prophet, for, so far, it was only in the form of mummies that he had been brought into relation with these inspired personages. He resolved, therefore, to summon into his presence, nay, into his very harem, the extraordinary being now in question. Would not the pharaohs have so dealt with the necromancers of their time? And was not he determined in all circumstances to follow the pharaoh's example? He therefore graciously directed Shaban to go and fetch the holy man. Shaban, transported with joy, hastened to communicate this invitation to the hermit, who, however, did not appear to be as much charmed by the summons as were the people at large. These latter filled the air with their acclamations, while Abu Gabdol stood still, his hands clasped and his eyes uplifted to heaven in a prophetic trance. From time to time he uttered the deepest sighs, and, after remaining long wrapped in holy contemplation, shouted out in his voice of thunder, Allah's will be done. I am but his creature. Eunuch, 
I am ready to follow thee, but let the doors of the palace be broken down. It is not meet for the servants of the Most High to bend their heads. The people needed no second command. They all set hands to work with a will, and in an instant the gateway, a piece of the most admirable workmanship, was utterly ruined. At the sound of the breaking of the doors, piercing cries arose within the harem. Abu Taher Ahmed began to repent of his curiosity. Nevertheless, he ordered, though somewhat reluctantly, that the passages into the harem should be laid open to the holy giant, for he feared lest the enthusiastic adherents of the prophet should penetrate into the apartments occupied by the women and containing the princely treasures. These fears were, however, vain, for the holy man had sent back his devout admirers. I have been assured that on their all kneeling to receive his blessing, he said to them, in tones of the deepest solemnity, Retire, remain peacefully in your dwellings, and be assured that, whatever happens, Abu Gabdol Gueman is prepared for every emergency. Then, turning toward the palace, he cried, O oh, domes of dazzling brilliancy, receive me, and may nothing ensue to tarnish your splendor. All right, that's going to be the end of part one. This tale is quite long, and I think it appropriate to break it up into a few parts, particularly since we're at a suspenseful moment. After the third part, I will be uploading some notes from this story, that go into detail about how it was that Clark Ashton Smith came to write it, what its origins were, and a little bit more besides. So this is one that struggled to be published. But for now, I'm going to get out of here and leave you wondering what will happen when Abu enters the Sultan's chambers. So, as always, like, comment, subscribe, and please do check out Thrilling Suspense Fantasy Volumes 1 and 2, which are available for purchase in the links below. Happy Clark Ashtober. Talk to you soon.